And he still got his truck, but I had mine. So. <laughs> and there was no 911, you know. <laughs> okay. Permit me to start really talking to you about my story in El Salvador. And I will begin with a story. That's the old, how else can we begin? Um, after I worked in the refugee camp, uh, we moved to a war zone um, because the bishop really wanted church personnel, church people, in areas where people were going to repopulate. I, thank God, did not live in El Salvador for all of the 12 years of war, only seven. So the war was adjusting. And people who were forced out of areas that were saturation bombing areas, everybody left our farming area. The only thing that had a few people was the urban section of our municipality. And when you drove into that city, you knew it was sick. Um, the level of no trust was super high. You can't trust anybody during the war. So you have to learn to distrust. You have to really be careful. That is something that has taken us a long time to try to get young people to build the virtue of trust and confidence. And now with a new problem like gang violence, ooh, the trust level is even lower because you can't tell the enemy. They're not in uniform because one group had one uniform and the other group had shabby clothes. But you knew they were soldiers. So I go with two other sisters, Franciscan sisters. So we were kind of ecumenical from the beginning. And they were from the Midwest. And uh, guess what my job was? To take care of organizing the farmers. I'm from New Jersey, OK? <coughs> and my job was to take care of all the men and get them to start replanting. So what really we were facilitators for materials to bring life back to life. No, they came back with nothing. I thought I knew what nothing was until I saw nothing. They came back from refugee camps in Honduras. This is 1987. And um, they came on buses with nothing. You know, just lots of kids and a few pots, things to cook in. So churches got together and I was deeply moved at the integration of the churches. They called it the diaconia. Deacon is the word for serving. You could call yourself deacons, no? to serve. And the diaconia was this kind of a consortium. And the churches didn't say, oh, there are more Catholics there, so the Catholics have to do pastoral, take care of the church stuff. No, no, no. Oh, okay. The Lutherans take church here, the Catholic church, they divvied it up. Uh, construction, education, health. And we, you see, these three uh, kind of feminists, we were loud mouthed, um, meaning we could go through the military checks. We had passports, and uh, they knew we were Catholic sisters. So um, we got there, and um, um, we did wonderful things with the stuff that were coming from wonderful churches. Most of them, by the way, from Germany at that time. Because um, the Germans, as you know, can, must give 10% to um, their churches and 10% to uh, groups like you give to. And they can be given to people out of the country. So our bishops and priests went to Germany looking for projects. Anyway. So I wind up in Suchitoto. I write a letter home to my mother, and she says, where are you? Are you in Japan? I went from San Salvador to Suchitoto. And I said, mother, that's a now what word. You know, I'm writing this in letters. We had no email in 1980s. Um, um, that's a now what word, mother. It means birds and flowers. I went to a paradise, mother, even though there was a war zone. I did, it is a paradise. There's a wild beauty about it. I, I live right near, near, um, a reservoir, a dammed up river that has caused havoc. But um, it's beautiful to look at. There are mountains that are good coffee plantations up there. And so I said, Mom, I'm in a paradise. You'd like Suchitoto, you know. Um, no one told me how to live in a war. 
Um, but we took our cues from the poor people, and mostly women. So anyway, one day I get a little note because we're supposed to report to the military every time we leave the municipality to these newly formed communities. Am I boring you? I'm looking at, I just saw the watch, that's why I'm asking. All right, so all these newly formed communities. And um, so I get a in order to leave, you have to get permission from the military. They knew where we were, and you had to go out in twos. We were four at that time. Um, once we got to Suchitoto, another sister came. So anyway, I get a note from a woman who told me that her daughter had been raped, and she told me where she was kind of living at the time. And there were no sisters home. I had to go by myself. I thought this was an emergency. So I left the nuns a note, said, it's a long walk, but I'll be back tomorrow morning. Uh, I should get home such and such a time, and I'll go to the hospital first. So I go, and a uh, very long walk, hours, and um, these are not settled communities yet. So they're in an area called Montepeque. And um, I go there, and uh, I take care of it. The girl's going to come back with me. You know, I do the hugging and the talking. And the... But then we get word that the military might be on the way the military forces, because these little communities would send word if they saw the military trucks. And so this little group that I was with, and there must have been about 50 of us, 40, they, um, they had to decide, well, should we leave or should we stay? It might be a false alarm. Well, they decided to leave. And, um, well, I, we all got on the back of a big flatbed truck. And um, we're bumping along, and all of a sudden, the truck driver made a left. And I'm thinking, well, oh, this isn't even a road. And uh, anyway, we go off this road on a little embankment, so we couldn't get the truck righted. It was a big sand truck. <clears throat> and um, so we all scattered. And I wound up with three women. No, two. I was the third. One woman had a baby, so she had a basket. Uh, I left my backpack on the truck, you know, like he had a fire drill, and so I didn't need that. I just ran with my papers in the, my jean skirt pocket. And uh, so we wound up three together, chit-chatting and nervous and talking about, oh, God, what are we going to do? And, but we slept a little, you know, off and on. And about 3 o'clock in the morning, we wanted a little more body warmth, and uh, so we got closer together. And the woman with the baby, she decided to open up her basket. And she took out to change the baby. But she took out first a whole stack of tortillas wrapped in like a dish towel. And oh, I was starving. I mean, a nervous eater. And here I am thinking the military will really be mad if they find us because I don't have permission to be here. And what will I go to? All right. And uh, they were nervous too because they could have been tortured or all carted away. My nervous, pretty low compared, no? Anyway, um, so. The woman next to me, when she saw the tortillas, she, this was her immediate response. Oh, no, she said, we can't eat your food. She said, you have to feed the baby. You have to keep up your strength. And I'm thinking, yeah. And, uh, but the woman with the, with the tortillas, she did this. After this came this. Oh, she said, no. She said, tonight we share our food. Tomorrow we share our hunger. I said, oh shit, I'm staying here. <laughs> I have so much to learn. Talk about stretching your soul. I thought I knew what solidaridad, solidarity was all about. Tonight we share our food. You know, I went to Salvador knowing that it was a country of earthquakes, but I didn't know that it was also a country of faith quakes. I can't tell you the number of faith quakes that I've had. This stuff that gets inside you, no? Um, and shakes you. Well, I just couldn't. Oh, tonight we share off. I will remember that if I'm still awake at the end. That, that is just that beautiful scar, okay? There is um, solidaridad. Solidar it sounds more beautiful in Spanish. Solidaridad, no? Um, it's not just a vague feeling 
of compassion for somebody who lives on the other side of the world. Solidarity, I think, is an attitude. It's a virtue. It's a duty. It's a firm determination to commit oneself to the common good. And by our actions say, when you're diminished, so am I, and when you're happy, so am I. No? Solidarity, according to a, a Nicaraguan poet, Giaconda Beji, she says it this way. I'll say it in Spanish first. She says, um, Solidaridad es la ternura entre los pueblos. It's the tenderness between peoples. The tenderness. No? Um, that was an awakening moment for me in El Salvador. One of the first really awakening moments. I had a few in the refugee camp besides the car being stolen. Um, the joy of seeing somebody else's stolen instead of mine, you know? Um, but I'll tell you, uh, that, um, that was a real faith quake. And um, it prepared me to listen carefully. When I was in the refugee camp, I started to listen carefully um, because I couldn't speak much. And I can remember they were always talking about somebody who has died. So, I mean, they were in the middle of a war. It had been going on for years. And they had to, re they had to say it. And they, here I was a new ear to, to listen. That, that was their mental health, telling the stories. And um, I can remember they're saying, oh, so-and-so died, and this one disappeared, and this one's... And they'd always end, but they will not have died in vain. I thought that was the end, like the movie, you know, a beautiful romantic end. They will not have, they'll always be remembered. After we in the camp about two months, I actually knew what they were going to say at the end, so I listened to hear the tone in which they said it. And it was, this is what I heard. They will not have died in vain. It was like an oath. They will not have died in vain. We will continue the struggle for justice and peace and for what are our human rights. Well, I tell you, I have a PhD in religion from New York University. I study with the Jesuits and theology and all that stuff. You know, I was, I'll tell you, I went to church differently. I went to that Catholic church the next week and I said to myself, oh my God, that's what I'm supposed to be doing here. Jesus will not have died in vain. I will continue that struggle for peace, compassion, generosity, justice. Well, I'll tell you, it's the same thing. You know, you renew your baptism, it's all up there. When you say, Nelson Mandela will not have died in vain, you feel, this is where it hear, you hear it. Jesus will not have died in, my mother will not have died in vain. I will live those values that she so treasured that I can not, I can't ignore them. So again, I said, oh my God, PhD. I'm learning from, okay. I said again, I'm staying here, no? Um, I've been in El Salvador as long as you've been trying to get rid of polio. You never thought it would take 30 years or you'd stick to it. I never thought I'd be there for 30 years. But I got glimpses like that of the promised land. That's what made me stay. I remember that our roads were mined, so we had to decide when we were going to put, I mean, I could keep looking at her. I mean, I'm there, what you're seeing, every now and then I see my face. <laughs> <laughs> and then I try to move away, but that light doesn't let me. Uh, yeah. Um, what was I saying? Somebody help me. The mine, the road mines, okay? So we would go downtown, the, those of us who lived in the urban section, we would go downtown to see what the bus could bring back because it could never go often. And they would pile the food on the roof and they would pile the food. Two people went, the bus driver and somebody did all the shopping. So we would come back with food on the roof, on the seats, in the aisles, because it may not go out for weeks. Okay. Well, that meant it was a social event. You went downtown to see what you could eat. And one day I saw a banana fall off the bus. I don't know whether it came out of a window, it came off the bus, but it was on the ground. And I saw a little boy and a goat go running after the banana. So I'm rooting for the boy kid, not for the goat kid, okay? <laughs> and guess what, the boy got it. And oh, I, I was just so happy for him. I watched him peel the banana with a big smile on his face. 
And he goes walking down, and as he's peeling, there's this old man sitting on the curb, and he passed the old man, and then he looked back, and he gave the old man the fruit. And he started to eat the skin. Oh my God, that's what I said. I wanted to look into the face of that child. I knew I would see the face of God, the face of a rotary man. Yeah, a face of someone who really will. Okay, I say to him, and I say, was that your, uh, you know, your su papa? He was chewing away. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to eat the skin of a banana, and I'm right in his face. I say, was that your, you know, your daddy, su abuelo? No, I said, but you gave him the fruit. Yeah, he's going like this. He said, I think he was hungrier than I was. Let me eat in peace is what he wanted to. Get out of my face, you know? <laughs> Maybe he said that, and I didn't get it in Spanish. Now, I can't tell you that I see that Monday, Wednesday, and Friday from every kid, but I get glimpses enough to say, I have to stay here. Um, and I, I can, for instance, we sisters were in privileged positions. First of all, we were trusted immediately. We were Catholic sisters. And when I went there, the, uh, the, the country was 95 to 98% Catholic. Now it's 65% Catholic. A lot of evangelical churches, but the majority are Christians, no? Um, anyway, um, the, uh, the important thing, I think, is that... Um, how can I say this now? Um, one, one thing that I think is, is so critical we were in privileged positions. I, I want to say this and not say it too harshly. Pri a critical position or a privileged position, that they were critical positions. For instance, ours was the safety zone in the town. Anybody could sleep in our house. You know, um, but sometimes we'd have 20, 30 people, mostly men, sleeping in the front room because they couldn't go home because of the curfew. And so, uh, you know, and, and then they'd leave and you'd give them, we had a lemon tree, you know, we'd give them some lemons and send them off. And, and they'd have to kind of sneak out of the house because they didn't want the soldiers on the corners checking on who was leaving because everybody who lived in the countryside who had returned were really rebels. And um, the, the military knew we were there for everybody, but if everybody came in from the campo, we were uh, working mostly with rebel forces. And um, nobody else could have them in their house in Suchitoto because the military would interpret it, you're on their side. But see, our lives were very different. They couldn't accuse us of, of sheltering a, a rebel force, you know. Um, they didn't like it, but they knew that they didn't stand a chance because officially we're there for everybody and we acted like we were there for everybody. So um, anyway, uh, people would come to us for all kinds of things. Somebody's being tortured. Can you bring them some food? They're up in the uh, penal and, you know, it's that kind of things. So we would be able to do things. And um, one day I was home alone and somebody knocked on the door and it was a woman and she said, there's a fresh head in the park. And I said, okay, 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 okay. And the person had to leave because they didn't want... They never wanted the military to see them staying a long time or doing anything with us, okay. <clears throat> so I said to myself, why did she say fresh head? I'm talking to myself, you know. And you wa I wasted a little time because I didn't want the military to see me going right there after she came because maybe he didn't know who she was, etc. So that gave me time. And <clears throat> I said to myself, oh, God, maybe I better bring a, a, a towel with the plastic bag, you know. Well, I went, and um, it was a fresh head. I needed to use the towel, and I knew him. He was an 18-year-old. His name, We called him El Afro because he had gray hair. And um, I knew his mother and father. His father just died this year, and his mom is still alive, Marta. And um, so I brought the uh, head of, of El Afro home and this... I couldn't wait for the sisters to come, just so you could cry with somebody else, you know, and um, it changes how you pray, that's for sure. 
And, uh, but it was a joy to be able to, after a day or two, to find a way to bury with his parents his head. That was such a consolation for them. No one could have done that. You know, and um, I want to tell you another story about Martha. Um, as a Catholic sister, I know a little bit about the Bible, the scriptures, and one of my favorite stories is when Mary and Elizabeth meet, and they're both pregnant. Um, you know, it's called the visitation, they visit. Mary discovers she's pregnant, and she travels to visit her cousin Elizabeth, who's also pregnant, and they're both surprises. Elizabeth's an old lady, and she's a young girl, and um, so Elizabeth and I made that walk because I did go to Israel and study. So I traveled as far as she would have had to go, and it was part of a walk. And um, anyway, um, I love that meeting, these two pregnant women. You know, Elizabeth knows this little girl must be even more afraid than she is, you know. And um, they hug each other, this full pair. Held, themselves, held each other circumspectly until Mary speaks. And Mary, I just hear her saying something like, you know, oh, I'm going to live forever. I'm going to live forever. I'll live on in this son. And you know how Jewish women are. I mean, their son. And, but I, I imagine these things, okay? So the sisters know I like that. And I received a photo of a piece of sculpture of that scene, that story, okay? And um, one day I was in Jersey City and going back, and I went to Copapayo where Martha lived. It was the first repopulation place. And um, I bought this for the nursery. And I arrived exhausted because you had to go 45 minutes on a boat after you got all the way to Suchitoto from the airport. But I figured, well, I'm going out, I'll stay overnight. But I gathered the women together and we talked and because we work mostly with women, catechists, etc. And so I showed them this picture and I said, oh, I know you'll identify with both of these women. They both lost their sons. And of course they knew Jesus was Mary's son and how he died. They weren't quite sure about Isabel, Elizabeth. And so they said, well, how did her son die? Well, now, John the Baptist was beheaded, okay? But Martha, the f mother of El Afro, was right there. And I didn't want to tell that story. So I said, oh, I'll tell you tomorrow. And they said, no, no, tell us the story. Tell us, oh, I have to tell the story. And so as I begin to say that, that Martha's son was beheaded, I look at Martha, and so does everybody else, and there's like a pregnant silence and Martha has these instant tears, but a little smile on her face, and she whispered, somebody knows my pain. And she started walking to me with the picture. You know, I have this, it was a, it's an elongated picture. And, um, and she kept moving towards me and kind of swaying. By the time she got to me, she was screaming, somebody knows my pain. She was weeping, she was smiling, and it was just she and I, the rest of the women left. And she just hugged me and, and I said to myself, oh my God, what I thought was going to make her fall apart consoled her. The story of that other woman, Elizabeth, you know, a thousand years ago, was still alive, and it consoled her. I said to myself, oh my God, we Catholics.